there's a national media site that um, just before I got in here published a story saying that Rogers um, uncertain status might have impacted things yesterday. Do you think there's anything to that as, as far as a leader goes and you, you know that happened in the offseason. Do you think there's any impact at all on that on, on this year's team? You're, you're talking about the offseason? Yes. No, I think this this team's focused on now and unfortunately sometimes in this league you, you get humbled and certainly we got humbled and like I said, it's it's about how we respond to that, how we come back to work, how we stay together and and get ready to play against the team that I know is gonna be really hungry coming in here. You wanna talk about the most overblown storyline for week one? That is that the Packers Aaron Rodgers offseason drama spilled over into week one against the Saints who as our first guest of the day knows are a hell of a football team year in and year out. Okay. Don't look like they're going to miss a beat at quarterback with Jameis Winston. And if you watch the game, which I know Thomas Dimitrov did, it was one of those games that just kind of got away from him. But Thomas, when you were general manager of the Falcons, you obviously spent a lot of time going head to head with the Saints. You know how quality of the organization that is from top to bottom. What did you see in this game? And, do, and look, I'm not in the locker room. You, you obviously understand what goes into chemistry and, and, and culture and so on and so forth. Am I missing something? Is there something to be said for the offseason drama carrying over into week one? Because a lot of things happen since then, like, oh, I don't know, training camp, preseason. There is no doubt that a lot of things have, ha have happened. And look, I have to say, I really appreciate how Matt LaFleur approached this. The reality is there are distractions. And if you're not a team that can handle distractions, then you shouldn't have distractions in the first place. This team, Green Bay, is a very good team with a very good quarterback. They have to wade through all this and clean it up. Hands down, we know that. Yes, they were playing a fantastic team. I know all of my Atlanta Falcon buddies and friends are going to be, you know, just killing themselves hearing me say that. But the reality is it's a very good football team. The way that Jameis was playing, they were, they were rocking it the other day. It looked good. Unfortunately, you just had a quarterback who's the best quarterback in the league who didn't have a good game. Let's not panic over it. The reality is there were distractions, and I've always said this, even my days in New England, and you guys know it really well, yes, we used it, but if you use it as an excuse, then I think at times that is a little bit of a shame on you for an organization. Deal with it, move forward. If you're going to be in the middle of it, you know what you're facing, take it on head on. You know what, Thomas, I had a, I had a, a bunch of questions in this notebook for you, a bunch of questions, well thought out. Well prepared, and I heard you say Aaron Rodgers, best quarterback in the league. So, uh, was that? Did you misspeak there? Aaron Rodgers, best quarterback in the league. We got Tom Brady. We got Patrick Mahomes. Aaron Rodgers. Elaborate, please. We we have we have some we have some great quarterbacks in this league, and Aaron Rodgers is one of the very very best. We'll put it that way. Thanks for calling me out on it. There are other quarterbacks that you just mentioned who are right up there. But any given Sunday, gentlemen, you know that this cat who's slinging the ball in Green Bay is still one of the very best in this league. He had an off day. Unfortunately, we're all going to look at it in a certain way, like it was wrong potentially that he did what he did and, and put Matt LaFleur and, and Brian Gutekinds in that funky spot. The reality is it is today's game. We talked about it recently. That is how things are going. When you have guys making $40-plus million a year, whatever the numbers are, uh, you know, they have a big say in an organization. So thanks for calling me out on that. Like you do, if I'm not, not on time getting back to you on my phone calls, Michael, the reality is you're right. There are probably three or four yeah. that are right up there at the very top. We'll get to your old guy, Tom Brady, in a second, but want to stay with the former Bucks quarterback in Jameis Winston. And you've obviously faced him for quite a long time. You've seen him since the beginning of his career, twice a year when he was in Tampa and you were in Atlanta, uh, obviously took that apprenticeship season under Drew Brees last year in New Orleans. What are you seeing in terms of, of his potential to thrive the second go round as a quarterback of, of a team like New Orleans with the infrastructure that's around him? I think there are a lot of people out there that are wondering, right? They're skeptical. The reality is he was raw and in a really maturing stage with Tampa Bay. 
we all know what his raw skills are and his natural athletic ability and natural quarterback abilities abilities are. That said, being around Drew, Drew and being around an organization that was as stellar as it has been in New Orleans was very good for his maturity level and his evolving. You know, obviously he's doing better now, and that's really important. I was one of those people that was a little bit skeptical. I thought I thought he was not going to win that job, and he obviously won it outright. It was good to watch him do what he did. Why didn't you think he'd win it? Uh, yeah, exactly. I was, I was just going to ask that. <laughs> I was going to ask, why yeah. did you think he'd win? <laughs> I just was wondering how things were going to transfer over. Having been around him and playing against him in Tampa, it might have jaded my vision of what was going on with him. Of course, he has natural skills. I just wasn't sure where he was as far as owning the team, you know, having the, the, the maturity level to take the team, not only on the, on the field athletically, but also from a leadership standpoint. I just needed to get my head around that. And it's, it's apparent from the people I know there as well. Uh, he's really starting to mature and evolve. So it, that's, a, that's a good place for him to be right now. Thomas, I've been so intrigued by uh, the Houston Texans situation. I think the last time you were on, I asked you about Nick Casario and Deshaun Watson, and the story just continues to change. And so uh, depending on who's reporting it, either Casario or somebody with the Texans is asking for a combination of six picks and players or five picks and players. Uh, how, how do you see this? this just wild situation with Deshaun Watson, how do you see it resolving itself? And it is it resolved in the 2021 season? Well, look, first of all, make no mistake about it. Nick Casario and crew are doing all of the analysis on this. This isn't just them trying to be a pain in anyone's butt, trying to get as much as they can. Of course, it is that at the core. But there are a lot of different things that are involved in this. The timing of this trade, I'm sure you guys have been following that a little bit. Right now, they don't know. If they make a trade with someone, they don't know where they're going to end up in the first round um, ballots as far as are they going to be at the back end of the draft? Are they going to be in the middle or the front? There are benefits to wait around for sure. I know it seems counterintuitive. It's tough for me to think about it from the standpoint of not for long and win now. You better get your best guy in there. You better either... Uh, cajole them into staying or try to get as much as you can get. I understand that. This is a really, really unique situation. I don't envy Nick Casario and, and the group there, that you know, how they're dealing with this. It was great to see them come out and uh, kick Jacksonville the yeah. way they did because it showed that they, they have a team that's, you know, getting behind David Cully and, and, and the group there. I've been reading more and more and understanding from the people I know at Houston that you know, the reality is Deshaun isn't stirring the pot. It's not like a mess within the building. Understand this, gentlemen. When you have a quarterback with such talent, yes, he's not playing. What I've realized over the years, the players really do, for the most part, bond behind their players, right? They see it. They try to, you know, seek not to be understood, but, but understand. They try to understand where he's coming from. They may have a little bit of resentment, but the reality is they're behind a player quite often much more than they are behind management. And I'm, I'm assuming knowing you classic guy that you are, I'm sure you sent Nick a text. I don't know if he responded or not, but just can you go a little bit more into really just their approach this offseason because Michael will tell you, we were talking about it like the Deshaun situation, which coincidentally today is Deshaun's birthday, but we were talking about it all offseason that kind of hovered over the organization, but quietly they did almost a an old one Patriot like Filene's basement. I think Michael was your reference back in the day. Filene's basement yeah, type yeah. shopping spree when it came to picking up a bunch of veterans. I thought they had a productive offseason. I know it was Jacksonville, who we'll get to in a moment. But A, I love to know if you talk to Nick, your good friend, since uh, Sunday's win. And B, just, you know, do they have potential to actually surprise some people or was it just Jacksonville at the end of the day? I would say, um, you know, again, they've worked hard to put whatever they put together, given, you know, some of the, the shortcomings on what they might have been able to acquire and where they are right now. They're going to work. As you guys know, there's not a harder work. And I said that there's not a harder work than Nick Casario, believe me. So he'll do whatever he can. You know, the, 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 the whatever you guys, however you guys describe that, the bottom base of dealings that they did, kudos to them for finding out what they could do to piecemeal, you know, a football team together. Is it Jacksonville? 
Look, I'm a big believer in, and again, any given Sunday, there is no team on this in this league that are horrible. Jacksonville has some good football players on there too. How they come together, I heard you guys talking a little bit earlier about Urban Meyer and such. That's a whole other topic of conversation. I get it. The reality is I think what they're doing in Houston is they are trying to learn. They're trying to help Coach Cully grow as well. Nick Casario is a neophyte general manager. They're trying to bring that organization back to having some semblance of order and not being the focus in this league on what is wrong and what is right with that organization. And that's a big thing as a team builder. You want to make sure you're doing all you can to settle people and have a little bit more of a, an even keel about you perception-wise as an organization. Hey, thanks for watching Brother From Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.